Our next speaker uh, is Ms. Suzanne Altenberger, um, collaborated with Phil Bolger and is the, in charge of Phil Bolger and Friends, Inc., the boat design company since 1952. Presentation title is On the Absence of a Low-Carbon Commercial Fishing Fleet in the U.S. by 2016. Uh, in her early teens, Suzanne Altenberger discovered the technical section of the local library with books on boats, ships, aircrafts, motorcycles, um, along with her father's workshop. De decades later, she visited uh, Phil Bolger in Gloucester, Mass, to discuss boat design and politics. At that time, at that point in time, a Bolger had been designing uh, boats for nearly 40 years with a fair amount of his work focusing on efficiencies, affordability, and reasonable seaworthiness. They became partners in life and work and collaborated for 15 years until his death with uh, greater than 60 boat designs and several hundred acre, uh, articles. Their collaborations highlighted uh, two uh, initiatives. One was an initiative to move the commercial fishing fleet of Gloucester into the 21st uh, century. Uh, and a second uh, effort was in response to a 2002 Naval Sea Systems Command inquiry, uh, a series of successful design projects that they carried out. That particular Navy project happens to feature a much lower operational carbon intensity than was ever proposed for the commercial fishing fleet. And uh, Ms. Altenberger is going to give us a, a view of, of all this and some of her ideas on these issues. Um, glad I've been invited. My late husband would tell you if you've got something interesting to say, you might actually receive an editor's open ear. Happen here as well. Um, it's a rather ominous title. How do I push this thing? This one here? Oh, that one, of course. You went in doubt, as. Let's just get right into it. I hope you're all buckled up. This is going to have to go fast. Lots of images. Uh, already brief introduction. He worked actively for 57 years. At the age of 74, the US Navy asked him, would you be willing to do some thinking for us? And they got a two for it, which they knew, and for now were quite productive. But the most important thing they actually did was local waterfront-related stuff. So this is quite a change of pace of what you've heard this far. This is actually on the edge of the working waterfront, hands-on if need be. And uh, you see the fundamentals here. Um, this is all, nothing of this is scientifically reviewed, uh, peer-reviewed. No, this is marketplace reviewed. Uh, his book started in 1972. It was actually published in 1948 in his first national magazine article. There's four more manuscripts uh, waiting. Uh, th this is a super yacht of our flavor. It's fully solar powered, if you can see, wind powered. Uh, she's about, I think she could build a 98% out of sustainable materials. And of course she does, unlike the mega yachts, uh, she does have 24 opening gun ports. So what's behind those is probably <laughs> classified. You would have seen her in the movie or can rent the movie tonight. Uh, in the back, LSD 41 is indication of one of our forays into the Navy's universe. We got together and we took it quite seriously. Just a brief rundown of what the range of boats is. Uh, it's a, about a 35 to 40 pound personal yacht, seven feet. And here's a, by the way, this one here, this is Fuma. You can find her on in Eureka, Humboldt State University. Uh, she's tied up at Wood Island Marina. She may be available for sale. She was meant to be an ocean going classroom motor sailor, the point was to sail quietly while sampling certain phenomena which you would not want to be able to try to test while you're generating a great deal of noise. So she would be purely wind powered on certain select occasions. Um, wild mix of things, mostly smaller fry below 60 feet. Every material you can think of, a light boat here, go fast fishermen, uh, San Francisco Bay. Human powered it, a couple of twins took this one 90 miles, the Erie Canal pedal powered to celebrate the 50th. Uh, this one is a fairly high performance sailing boat, but with two feet of draft. So when you're done with the sailing exercise, the kids got bought your beach and the kids go beach coming. Uh, this is the big time for us. It was an unusual situation. We were approached with a, a question. We know, we know you normally don't do this kind of stuff, but how would you haul two main battle tanks at 20 knots over 200 nautical miles? And that's a pregnant one-liner. Uh, we got to work, we, we successfully addressed the question and quite a few years later, we got to publish it. This is a top-level monthly magazine in the United States Navy universe. And since it's the biggest Navy, this is probably the magazine to be in. And as you notice, I'm the lead author here. 
Uh, this is about uh, four years after my husband's death. And this you get a sense why this is of interest to them. It's a rather unusual, spectacular exercise of how to maximize a well deck ship, the interior amphibious uh, ship, the well deck space. It's like a giant dry dock inside a Navy ship. How to maximize to put as many of these in there as the Marines may need and use a cross section. This is a preliminary study. We wouldn't want to study, we wouldn't want to publish the actual later editions of this in public like that. We don't give away stuff for free. Um, this was a brilliant moment I found uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps discussing our project, first without naming our names or the project, but he did the hand movement of the folding boat twice. Look it up at that particular URL, 2014. But then six months later, it hit print. He wrote a piece on it. And without going into details, he spends more word count on our work than on anybody else's. I'm very jealous about those things. But now back to what we actually are here for. Uh, this was a braggadocio part, you're back in a working waterfront, fishing boats. These happen to be wooden boats, but other things have been done as well. Um, we noticed that uh, we've got a real challenge when I'm in a commercial fishing fleet. And I'm here in an institution of science, and science is part of the problem at this point in time. Uh, here's why. I'm, I'm going to aggravate you for a few as I'm racing through this, but I, bear with me. you better be buckled up here. Um, when you discuss fishing, commercial fishing, it really, the, the, the discussion should consist of two elements, the resource, fish, shellfish, everything that lives, and the fishing fleet. Both are co-equal. They are two halves of a whole. Otherwise, you would have no industry, you would have no fishing, we wouldn't eat fish. Uh, at least not wild-caught fish. Uh, however, 98% of our discussions related to commercial fishing cover only one half of the agenda. It's always about the biomass this, life that, and the other half, 50%, the fleet structure, daily operations, plus shoreside infrastructure, usually get completely ignored. And that does lead to distinct distortions in the discussion here. We come to polemically refer to as the 50% model of industry governance. And that's what it really is. We get quite polemic, quite aggravated. We've been in the trenches for coming up on 14 years. It's been very expensive and very frustrating. Um, so we're looking at a federal government and a scientific community, some of you folks in this room, and many of the industrial players were pretty much living to the 50% fixation about who gets what fish, when, where, and how. But there's no support, no discussion, no round table, nobody of this, any kind of discussion about, do we have a 21st century fishing fleet in the works? Or do we not? And we don't. Um, so we're ending up here with a fishing fleet commercial industry in this country, almost every coastline. And our Canadian friends aren't any more sober than this. They're actually as, as manic as, uh, they're as high carbon there as they are here. Um, we're living with a fleet from the 70s and 80s, um, if not worse. And so we got uh, one more particularly aggravating exercise, really stunning. 1994, NOAA generated in New England, and then it went nationwide in 1999, a particular set of regulation that froze this fleet in time. Picture an industry frozen amber for the last 22 years, and you expect that fleet to be capable of dispelling ecology, sustainability, and low carbon. It's not going to happen due to federal dictates. And I've said this to our regional administrators, both generations. I've spoken in this language to our federal folks in Silver Spring, Maryland. No resonance yet. Um, they tried this. I'm going to race through this. They tried their limit by tonnage, by horsepower length. They got a whole bunch of things right, but a whole bunch of things wrong, as simple as that may seem. What they did produce is, without going through all this, if you want to contact me, um, tarnish is uh, what they meant by tarnish was not what I should have meant by tarnish. This is a really different definition of tarnish. Horsepower, yes, maybe, except you and I know that you could tweak an engine doing this and that. It may not necessarily mean what it says on the label. Uh, which leaves length, and length is not size. Weight would be size, mass would be size, displacement would be size. US Navy knows that. <laughs> US Navy lists this vessel by displacement, not by some volume tonnage or taxation tonnage or Swedish land miles or whatever exotic reference here. Um, this, is, this is a real issue because we had long and lean fishing graph, but we also have absurd fishing. I just looked at national fishermen last year again yesterday. Up to 60 by 30 foot wide boats. That's not a way towards sustainability. That's grotesque. It's what I mean, the gentleman with a with with billionaire's yacht, these guys have a good time. They're elegant, perfect work, fine, cutting edge, and very few people can afford it, but we can learn a lot from his work. But we can't le learn anything about a regulatory dictator that produces grotesque high carbon boats. We've never seen a fleet obesity as bad as right now. You will not find a single historical uh, situation where you'd find boats that are two units of length to one unit of beam. It's just not going to ever happen. Should not have happened, but it has. Um, so you end up with a situation where the fleet is not fit to respond to ecological challenges, 
carbon intensity concerns, fuel cost levels, it, you, you simply end up with a situation that is permanently dis distorting the fleet, at least for the last 22 years, make it more like 25 and counting, because these boats last. You distort the fleet in, in a situation where it simply is exposed to resource fluctuation. Is there enough fish to pay for this? Is there going to be uh, fuel cost fluctuation? We know all about that. Um, how materials, machinery, consumable cost of ice transportation, plus the pending likelihood of carbon overuse taxation. Nobody's prepared for that. There's not a single round table at NOAA, not at NIMS, nowhere, nowhere. Remember, we got into the head of a four-star general. That boat is actually quite green, that assault lighter. We can't make headways into the federal government on the NOAA level, which is really quite a bit lower than a, than a federal government at a Pentagon level. So we end up with a really embarrassment for the fleet because they should be stewards of the resource. They cannot be because they've got high fleet, a high carbon fleet around their neck. I'm racing because we've got lots of pictures here. Now you end up with a really strange set of boats. Lumpy thing, fat entry lines. They will be ice prone in winter. They drive slow even in summer. Take a great deal of BTUs, kilowatts to simply get going. It's a, it's a tragedy. Here's a real cartoon in Jacobson because this guy was quite serious. He got a good boat. Short, fat, deep, it's, it's not where you want to go. Look at a short, fat fish, you know what's happening to him versus long, lean predators. Um, it's, it's a crude, simple, kindergarten type of reality. Foxy lady, some of you guys go to the same club again and again. Uh, you've got 40 by 18, 40 by 20. We don't want to go there, we don't want to be there. These are all dramatic pictures made for great, you know, big, white, foamy waves. Designed locally, actually, regionally over New Bedford. Launched 2003. 1,000 horsepower, and this is underneath the water. Beautiful steel workmanship, elegant work, and if you want to go slow, do that on the outside of the boat. Because you and I know you can radiate a cool 1,000 horsepower engine. Telephone companies, maybe everybody has these things, and a, and a radiator that can cool 1,000 horsepower diesel continuous duty rated is about five by five by eight inches. Five feet by five feet by eight. So it's not like it's gonna kill the boat. I'm not sure whether any of you boys have radiated. Um, this is what should have happened, but this is, you have this level of combination of innocence, raging ignorance, and to some extent, from a designer's perspective, arrogance. I just give you that. You live with that. And that's, you see, the numbers don't lie. I mean, you see, we simply took a, a local vessel and we just applied one of our concepts to it. Run just very crude numbers. Uh, but you see the differences here. Uh, cost, annual cost, between 31000 versus 85400 hundred dollars, eighty five hundred dollars. And it's a long term liability. Even even if you can support the cost, is it green? No, no, it's not. And how will you uh, be fortified against any fluctuations in resource, again energy cost? And uh, again all this on the background of twenty five years worth of a defective freeze of evolution. Um, our solution was everybody comes in with a boat, hang the boat in travel lift, no ice, no crew. No gear, no shenanigans. Justice of the Sea Coast Guard officer, weigh the damn thing in a certified travel lift, put it in your permit, then go forth, and then come to Sweet Suzanne, not so sweet, or across the old field or other folks, give me a long, lean 21st century fishing machine. Not allowed. Not in your blessed day will this be allowed. We could do this every vessel between half an hour to maximum two hours over a fair haven, 400 tons travel lift the biggest one in New England. We could crank the whole fleet and, you know, doing the annual haul out. We would know from then on how much each vessel weighs. And then you'd only limit the fishing permit by weight and horsepower and total allowable catch, which let's open that door. It's something else. So we don't have any chance to pursue long lean and mono house. We don't have a chance to pursue multi hull geometries. It simply is prohibited by federal statute. You just see where we're going with this. We have the leading federal agency, the biggest such, I believe, on the globe, that prides itself on how to define sustainability. And then they insist on a high carbon dictator in a commercial fishing industry, which is exactly the wrong thing you should be doing because what you should be doing is you should look at the industry as a canary in a coal mine indicator how bad things are. What would it have to have to be a low carbon 21st century boat? Least resistance running, there's a whole bunch of ways of doing this. Adequate stability obviously has to be workable. Variable geometry, drive pin, yes. Difference between dragging and going long distances. You may want to shift gears. Some people do it, except we could do better. But not enough of any of that, even those people who do do this, not, not good enough, it seems. We should be looking at wind power, not for the romance, not for the sea shanty. We can do that too, but there's actually sensible ways of doing this. Uh, 
low least carbon renewable home materials. We built boats out of trees for a long time, and it's not a sick joke. And, I, I, and of course, we're, we're, I'm, I'm going to show you what that means. And what we also want to look at a plausible degree of sinking resistance. Killing your clients is a bad business model. Widows and orphans know where you live. See, this is what the Navy does to a wooden boat, 1,400 tons, bigger than some of the yachts that your gentleman is showing us earlier. If the Navy can do this to a wooden structure, I think it's good enough for the Navy. It might be good enough for the fishing fleet. And by the way, also for your research fleet. Anybody who thinks your research was must be out of steel, aluminum, or unpronounceables. This is the US Navy. They built 14 of these. The Soviet Navy built dozens of them between 72 and to today, Russian Navy, same type, wood, polyester, fiberglass. Japanese Navy built up to 500 tons of wood, 1,000 tons of wood. Taiwanese Navy, wood minesweepers. Folks, you know, this is not romantic, silly, this is reality. Here are some examples of old fashioned simple shapes, quite unsophisticated, except they ran with limited power, seaworthy. This is an extreme case, subchaser, designed 1914, 15, 16 or so. 300 built for US Navy, 100 more for the French Navy. 235 certified transatlantic crossings. Look at the proportions. 105 on a wall line by 149 on a wall line. This is a 7 to 1 length to beam ratio ride. If you show this to a modern fisherman, he's going to have an apoplectic fit of some sort. You want to kill me. These guys went across the Atlantic, North Atlantic before weather balloons, before airplanes, before the Coast Guard would come and save your hide. Once they were decommissioned, guys went fishing with these things. And what did they fish? Eastern rig dragon. They put the bag over the side. You know, you figure, well, seven to one, she must be awful. Well, they did it. Now, we can do fat boats. This is where we are right now in terms of fishing boat design. Many people do this voluntarily. They get paid to do this. We wouldn't do this for all of in China. Talking about the earlier, the three overlapping circles, how much you want to pay uh, in order to do a decent job. We wouldn't want to do this kind of work unless it really is a marine claim for somebody who simply has 30 feet of feet every year, and you want to get a 29 and 11 inch boat. Um, but we looked at this, how can we sort of break through this conspiracy of stupid on this? Um, here's something we shared with folks, you know, kids can build this, folks can build in the barn over the winter. Uh, my design first one without fill again. I finished finally building it with these very own hands, about 60% of the labor of that boat is my own work. She finally got launched, it works just fine. But notice she's fine and narrow too, 4.5 length to beam ratio. Here is a 40-foot exercise we just threw out there to have something to talk about with local fishermen. We got a lot of folks in our office who went out on their boats. Here is a dirty cartoon for a 50-foot, just right from the point, a somewhat clean exercise for a 70-foot, which, by the way, would make a decent research mess. And uh, these are all boats you can build locally, build them out of sustainable materials, no need for any molds, no need for upfront investment up the wazoo. You can get going on this if you have the space, you've got the will, you've got the budget for the materials. This is what something like this would look on the inside. Very straightforward, nothing but that which you need. You know, it's the fish in the middle, so she wouldn't trim any funny. 220 horsepower to do the work on the 70 footers. So you're looking at 11 knots and all sorts of range to go thinking. So Phil and I pushed this. It was one of his last public appearances. We pushed it in a national fisherman. We pushed it at local meetings. We finally got against three years worth of complete obstruction as editors. We pushed in local paper along us, the Gloucester Fisherman Project. Went nowhere. Not because fishermen are stupid, but the feds and the regional government won't allow this. We pushed and pushed, collected signatures. This is in a British Columbian fishing magazine. You got a fisherman's perspective, you've got my perspective, because I went out there. Eco Trust of Canada flew me in for a six day field trip. Very productive. Come home, I come home, no resonance because we are not allowed to. Regional ecological folks, Conservation Law Foundation, and on taking this to the green, taking New City Council, New Chamber of Commerce, again, National Fish, we push and push, last rant, New Bedford Standard Times, full page, they get to have me have my say, it was very therapeutic, it still hasn't gone anywhere. So we contribute to the discussion, comment on ecosystem-based fisheries management, because we simply said you will not get to ecological consideration as a management process if you have a high carbon fishing fleet. As scientists, you simply can't get there from here. It's silly. And of course, we discussed the vessel baseline amendment, which was passed without any of our input. Obviously, we flagged the desk. And so we ended with a real mess on our hands. 
And, but also we have a, with a list of what we think you've got to get done. So I'm just not going to read any of this. We're running out of time here. But we thought about quite a bit. There's 13 items we think you can go down the list of. One of the most important things is do finally pull out the high carbon dictates that continue to be exercised every day through law enforcement, including our Coast Guard friends who insist you're going to have to submit to this dictate. And uh, discuss, uh, you know, how would we contextualize a green fleet? How would we insist on having this progress being initiated? We we'll finally catch up for over a quarter of a century of stagnation. In fact, a thou shall do attitude, which by now fishermen say, I can't even think about that. It's become, it's now muscle memory. It's an ugly, the ethics of this are really dark, really dark stuff, particularly for so called ecologists who get paid quite well. You look up what these people are worth on the federal level. They're doing good, thank you. They shouldn't be finding this acceptable, but so far they still do. You should be able to incentivize the industry. You can support all sorts of ways to instead of bail out, buy out, offer people migration from high carbon boats to green boats. Um, dedicated R&D into certain fishing methods that might help the resource. And then put it all in Magnus Stevens Reauthorization Act, which is the act that runs the National Fishing Universe. Um, let's forget about sustainability on large fish ships that flee, a lot of people would say. Uh, economies of scale, large vessels, that would be the way to go. Not necessarily. And uh, other folks here, it doesn't really matter who's in the White House. It hasn't happened. Um, our green friends, the EDF, Pew, the biggest global ecologist, look through the annual reports, and good luck you finding any language in favor of a green fishing fleet. You'll be searched. Maybe it happened last week. I missed it. But so far, no dice. Leading ecologists, scientists, not, will not engage. So we've been pushing. There are a few signs. I'm here today because a leader in the Massachusetts University says, upset. you may want to go over there. And uh, good, good, good. See, we, we can't find anything in here. Look at this. National Pacific Ecosystem-Based Fishermen, not a word about green fishing fleet. Uh, not a word in National Strategic Science Plan, Northeast Fishery Science Plan. That's astonishing. Not a word about a green fishing fleet. Nothing in that climate change strategy. What's a core problem? Let me summarize it on that note. Staffing choices. None of these people are malicious. They're not unethical. They don't wake up in the morning and you know, how can I screw up the neighborhood? Oops, what did I do here? Um, but what did happen is that the hiring practices excludes folks who are geocentric, both centric. They're scientists, legalese, law, everything. Just nobody down the hall you can talk to. If you regulate like this, what will happen then? Hasn't happened. I've been told this by mid level staffers at NOAA. Uh, Silver Springs, Maryland, not invented here for reflex. Yes, aggravating. When folks like me come out of the woodwork for 10, 12, 14 years and keep bitching and hollering, they don't want to hear that. It's understandable, but it, the issue doesn't go away just because you don't like me. And finally, there's a distinct formal indifference to outside input. You may submit comment, or you may speak in public, you may write in public. It does not matter. So in conclusion, we are not where ecologists think we should be. None of them have engaged on that. None of the biggest ecological groups have engaged on this. Our scientists are not pursuing a 100% spectrum. They still do 50% thinking. None of the science and statistical committees of the, of the whole federal fisheries management council system has ever touched this by 2016. North Pacific Fisheries Management Council maybe just begin to touch. They just discovered maybe both have something to do with the fishing industry. Maybe, maybe, but not, not quite yet. Let's not go too far. It won't be too radical. So we end up with this tragedy. Professor Jane Lubchenco, a real academic, highest degree, in the trenches in the state university system. You folks know state university. Not too much money, but it's a good gig. She reaches to the top level of her professional attainment, becomes fellow administrator, but she presides over high carbon fishing throughout her whole tenure, a high carbon fishing fleet that goes unreformed, unreconstructed. And can we therefore snidely slander her by saying, She's a high carbon dictating ecologist. You go figure. But she didn't fix it. So I still hope for a public private partnership because of the language I've used before. I didn't break any China today. And how green is your fleet, by the way? Let's take, take one apart. So this one does to see who the man is, who the man was. Without him, none of this would have happened. So I thank you for your patience. I apologize for my rapid pace. Only 82 shots. I couldn't restrain myself. I didn't have much lead time. And I have only had one cup of coffee today, so, so thank you.